Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1988 film Maniac Cop. And when I'm doing this review, it's available on the Shutter streaming service. Also with Maniac Cop 2 and Maniac Cop 3, which I do plan to watch and do reviews for as well. So look out for those. Now, this is my first time actually seeing Maniac Cop. I've known of it. I've heard good things about it. And it will also be my first time watching the sequels. So just know that. So... Here are my feelings on it that I'm about to get into. Obviously, it's spoilers since this is an older film. Now, this was directed by William Lustig. There's a good name that you like to hear because he directed Maniac. Yes, with Joe Spinell in it. Man, great film. I love Maniac. So I guess he's following up the Maniac thing with, it's not just Maniac, it's a Maniac cop this time. And it is. Uh, he also directed Maniac Cop 2 and Maniac Cop 3 Badge of Silence, which I'm excited to dig into. And that's one of the things is Lustig is a good director, and you see that come through definitely in this film. There's some really nice direction in it. There's some really cool cinematography as well, and I'll talk about uh, at least one in particular shot in the film that I was very pleased with. It was very visually awesome and loved it. I'm sure people who have seen it might be thinking of the exact same scene right now. So this was scripted by Larry Cohen, uh, which he's, you know, done some crap, but he's done some really good stuff as well. And um, for people who are deep into the horror scene, like, you know the name Larry Cohen because he's done some amazing stuff that you should remember. Uh, for me, personal favorites, Cue the Winged Serpent. I really love that movie. Uh, and also The Stuff. Both films that I saw before Joe Bob did them. Yes, I have seen films before Joe Bob's done them. It, it, plenty of people have, but for some reason there ends up being this this notion that if you talk about a film that Joe Bob's covered, it's because Joe Bob covered it. Sometimes that is the case for me, definitely, but um, sometimes it's not. Uh, but I would say definitely check out Cue the Winged Serpent and the stuff if you haven't seen it. He's also done stuff like It's Alive, which I actually haven't seen yet. Um, God Told Me To, also haven't seen Full Moon High, Maniac Cop 2, and Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence. So I'm very excited with the fact that Lustig and Cohen are both involved in the two sequels. That is amazing. That doesn't happen very often either, that the people who scripted and directed the first one end up doing the sequels. It usually changes hands after that. Sorry for my cat yelling in the background. Chloe. Shh. She wants attention. Don't we all? Uh, so there's great talent in this, obviously, like Bruce Campbell, who is obviously in, you know, Evil Dead and Ash vs. Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, all that stuff. But my favorite, potentially my favorite, um, other than the Evil Dead's, Bubba Hotep. Great in Bubba Hotep. If you haven't seen it, definitely check that out. Uh, and then Tom Atkins, man. Love Tom Atkins. Uh, you might know him from such things as Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, which I think he's most well-known for, but also The Fog, which he is wonderful in, and Night of the Creeps, and Escape from New York, and Creep Show. I mean, the titles that this guy is in. He's a great actor, and I think, to be honest, he's my favorite part of Maniac Cop. I think his acting is awesome. It's always great to see him on screen. So I was very pleased with him being in here. And then as the, the maniac cop himself, Robert Zadar, which I just know Robert Zadar from the film Samurai Cop, which he, I think, wrote and directed and starred in. Uh, I own Samurai Cop. And let me tell you, if you haven't seen it, if you love so terrible, it's awesome films, Samurai Cop is one of the best. So terrible, it's awesome. And Robert Zadar is in it. So if you liked him in this... Yeah, it's pretty different, but he speaks. He actually speaks in Samurai Cop, so check it out for sure. This film lost almost half a million dollars. It had a $1.1 million budget, so it didn't really do that well. Um, I don't know why. Like, it's, it's actually decent, and one of the things I like about it most is that it's not just, it's not a horror movie. I actually think it's more action than anything, but it's partially like a police procedural in a way too with, you know, Atkins as McRae going around trying to solve this mystery. And back when this came out, I'm sure people when they were watching it had no clue who the actual killer was. So if you kind of put yourself in that mindset, it's structured very well to kind of keep you guessing for quite some time uh, until they actually you know, reveal what's really going on at the, I think it's at the junkyard, or is it a junkyard? That's a port, I think, maybe. Um, yeah, so 
In 2018, it was actually said that there was going to be a remake in the works and that the remake would end up having a totally different tone. That could mean pretty much anything, but, you know, maybe it's a com comedic tone. Maybe it's, you know, something else. I don't know. And then last year, 2019, apparently, HBO reported that they were picking up a Maniac Cop TV show. Interesting. Uh, produced by Nicholas Winding Refn. Now, I have mixed feelings on that because I really do like some stuff that Refn does, but I really don't like some stuff that Refn does. And he's one of those uh, people uh, that when they direct, they jerk themselves off on screen, basically. You know what I'm saying. Like, he's, he's one of these directors who just thinks the world of himself and everything he does is the best and, the, and, and you should think so too. And for that reason, I don't really like that guy. Uh, that said, I do, like I said, I do like some of his stuff. But if he's producing, maybe he's not directing. I don't know. We'll see. But that sounds interesting. I would love to see an HBO Maniac Cop series. That could be cool. So uh, it's a cool way to do the uh, opening credits with this one. Uh, if you're going to show opening credits, do something with it. And with this one, they do. You know, uh, Maniac Cop is putting all his stuff on. He's basically getting ready to go out and victimize people. So it's, it's, it's something to look at, and it's interesting. The beginning shows the dangers of the streets, but it also kind of shows that people are kind of alone on the streets because when they have that bystander who does come you know, forward later and says, you know, I saw this, but he sees the woman being mugged and he's just like, not going to get involved. So it kind of sets this tone of the streets are rough. And even if you're in a, in trouble, there's no one to turn to literally no one to turn to, at least for this lady in the very beginning, because she believes she's turning to the police. And in a way she is because he Cordell was a police officer, but she gets killed by the police. And it's a crazy situation because even at that point, the muggers are like shocked and kind of like, oh my gosh, what's going on here? Um, and that's kind of a really cool moment is like showing their reaction. Uh, because then you also realize that like at that point, she would have been better to just give up her purse. Like give in to the muggers and be like, here's my purse, bye. Because she lost her life when she thought she was going into the arms of the law. Uh, what a twist for the vic. Uh, I, I said it was what a twist for that, basically, of of the the woman being killed not by the muggers but by the police police officer. Um, I like the aspect of the physical acting for Zadar's character, uh, the actual maniac cop. Uh, it makes it more interesting and it makes the killer seem kind of more sinister. Uh, between him not really talking and also his like crazy over the top strength that he has. It definitely creates a more sinister feel to it. Now, obviously, he, I wouldn't say talks at the end, but he makes a noise with his voice at the end. So I guess he could talk, maybe. I don't know. We'll see, I guess we'll see in the second one, maybe. If it's even the same Maniac Cop, I don't know. I'll find out. I haven't looked ahead. The concrete kill in this, where he just kind of, like, smashes a dude's face in the concrete, and I guess he suffocates, or he, like, fractures his skull. I don't know. Uh, that's a dumb kill. It's very lackluster. But the aftermath of it, when they show the next day and they're, you know, they're jackhammering it, trying to get the guy out, uh, that's kind of a funny moment because it's like, oh, his face, like, hardened into the concrete. Like, it's a funny visual and it's a funny idea behind it. But the actual kill when it was happening, I was like, this is dumb. Can I get a better kill here? Uh, the way they did the scene with the woman killing the cop was really good because it really kept you guessing. And that's kind of a smaller uh, look at what the script itself is doing on a larger scale of just kind of like keeping you guessing for quite some time. Because when the woman's like, you know, she just hears on, on the radio that, oh my gosh, you know, there's this killer, potential killer cop out there. And then a cop's coming up to her car. She's like, she's flipping out. And so that she then shoots him. Like it was a really well done scene because you as a viewer are just like her at that moment. Like you don't even fully know if that's going to be the maniac cop or not. And then it ends up not being, and then you feel terrible. You're just like, oh my gosh, this is awful situation. Uh, and that, you know, obviously ruins that woman's life. But this kind of speaks to something I'll kind of touch on later. It kind of speaks to the pandemonium that can ensue whenever there's uh, a story kind of like that in the media and how humans in general are just prone to being panicky and just going over the top and just becoming super paranoid when there's something like that. I mean, obviously that woman 
no matter what police officer walked up to her or how they did, she was going to be suspicious. And it may have been the same outcome because that story got into her mind the way it was potentially sensationalized. And she just, she was going to look at every single police officer as the potential killer. When odds would have it, they wouldn't be the killer. But just saying. Paranoia is a strong thing. Uh, and fear. They shot this to keep you guessing about who the maniac cop might be. But if you know the who the actor is, there's actually no mystery. That's one of the things I kind of hate about how uh, Shudder promotes this film. Because on the website, like when you go to actually click on the play button, it, the backdrop is a picture of Robert Zadar's face as the maniac cop. So it's totally giving it away there for anyone who hasn't seen it yet. But, you know, it's my fault because it's from 1988. So just saying. Uh, the killer just keeps popping up all over randomly. It's crazy. But it's good because it kind of sets this tone of you never know when, you never know why, you never know how. Like, it creates so many questions and it kind of keeps... I wouldn't say it really keeps you on edge because it's not that scary or anything. But it kind of um, puts you in this place where you're like... He could pop up anywhere, and he could kill anyone, and yeah, I like that. I like how the lawyer actually uh, immediately thinks that Jack actually killed his wife. Uh, he doesn't even give him the benefit of the doubt. He asks him no questions. He's just like, okay, here's how we play this, because obviously you're guilty. Uh, that was just kind of funny to me, um, but that's, you know... That's kind of feeding into the lawyer stereotype about how terrible lawyers are. And I feel like this film, and I'll talk about it more a little bit later, <clears throat> this film's kind of pointing out um, about assumptions that people make, you know, whether it's it's assumptions out of fear, whether it's assumptions out of um, uh, guilt by association, uh, what profession someone is and what that says to them. That's one of the big things that's shown about the police, but also with this lawyer, because what does everyone assume about lawyers? That if you're a lawyer, you're a scumbag, you're a terrible person. And that's not true. One of the big things that this brings up is everyone, well, it makes me think about, everyone is an individual. And profession doesn't necessarily mean anything about that person. You don't know what their motivation is. You don't know why they did what they do. And you don't know their behavior either unless you've been able to experience that. Look for people's actions don't assume why they're doing things. Just saying. I'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, this does make me think that stories about people encountering issues usually don't come up until something gains attention within the news. It's like uh, it's kind of like when people feel val people end up feeling validated that that wasn't just like a one-time thing, or that what they experienced actually wasn't them just making something up that it was a legitimate thing, and then they feel more comfortable about coming forward with those things. Now, I started thinking about that because of the scene where Atkins and the other police officer are in the bar, and they're showing on the news all these people talking about, oh yeah, you know, because I know a cop who did this, and the cops are bad because of this and stuff. It just got me thinking because, you know, those people probably weren't talking about that until this story came out in the media. And then it's this combination of feeling validated oh, of, oh yeah, I experienced something like that too. But also, you know, I thought maybe this was a one-off, but I guess maybe it's not. And that's just something that ends up happening when things, you know, become big stories. Um, is the, I started thinking very early in this film, is this some sort of like zombie situation with the maniac cop? But it actually be, ended up being so much better than that. I actually love the twist of him basically being brain dead, but not actually being dead and then being able to survive. And then he's kind of zombie like because he's not totally in control of all his faculties. Um, it was cool. It, it was the, there's this tendency a lot of the times to just go to zombie because it's a branded thing that people already know. So to kind of go your own way in creating something like Larry Cohen did here, I think it speaks to the level of creativity he has and it worked. I think it's cool. I, I think it's better than if he would have been some sort of like zombie, even though he is a little zombie ish. The detective work of McCray is what sets this film apart for me pretty much. Um, and, and also, with a lot of these types of films where it's like killer on the loose type thing, it's more just like straight up. It's like killer's on the loose, people are going to get killed, let's see who gets killed, how they get killed. 
with this, it, it, you do have that aspect to it, but you have that really nice portion of McRae actually doing the detective work, getting in there, investigating. So it's a little bit, like I was saying, you know, it's action, it's police procedural, and it's kind of horror, but it's less horror than those other things. And that's cool. Like, I like these hybrid genre films. Uh, it's very nice. So good job, Larry Cohn. R.I.P. I like how the jail scene was actually shot. The one with um, that's in his memory, like Cordell reliving this, um, where it was showing him initially when he was being taken into the jail. Like, the way they shot that in slow motion, and then they had all the looks from all the inmates. Like, you could feel how dangerous that situation was. So it was very effectively done, and I really like it. And then, obviously, that leads up to the you know, shower scene where he gets shanked and, you know, you learn about his demise. Uh, but then that made me start thinking, like, is this what Cordell in that state, that almost zombie-ish state, is that what he keeps going through? Is he's just reliving these terrible memories, like, all, over and over and over again? Because if that's the case, it would kind of speak a little bit to the character that he is of just being angry and just willing to kill because he's just living, reliving all the pain and anguish and awfulness of his life. Um, I like how Jack tells Teresa to just hotwire her car at one point when he's telling her, like, get out of the precinct. Uh, and this kind of points to something that was happening a lot in 80s and 90s shows and movies, which is, for some reason, it seemed that everyone just knew how to hotwire a car. It was just common knowledge. And here it is showing itself once again. And I always have to laugh when that comes up. I, I mean, I do. Because it's so absurd that, like, everyone just knew how to hotwire a car in the 80s and 90s. Like, Come on, that's ridiculous. It sucks terribly that McCray gets killed in this. I was really bummed by that because I was like, no more Tom Atkins. No! he Like I said, he was my favorite part of the movie. He was great. And I do think that when he died, it wasn't as good. That's just my personal opinion. Because Jack ends up being the big hero, you actually end up forgiving him, forgetting about and forgiving him for being an unbelievable adulterer. But I think this points to something that rolls into everything else in this film, which is you don't know a person. And there's a lot of gray area. And just because someone does something bad doesn't mean that they can't then do something good. And in this instance, he's a complex character. Like everyone, every actual human is. No one's purely bad or purely good. It's always that gray area. It's always a mix. So they're showing that on full display here. Like, when you first meet him, uh, Jack is awful because he's an adulterer. He's cheating on his wife. He's been cheating on his wife. That's terrible with a co-worker. And then you get to, um, the, you know, all the events after that when he's you know, wrongfully accused of being a murderer. And then he becomes this huge hero and he saves the day in the end. And then you feel very differently about him. So it's a cool look at how someone can be bad and good at the same time because that's real life. And I think we as a society need to be a lot better about recognizing those things. Just because one person does something bad, one thing bad doesn't mean they're a, a terrible person forever and that you should never speak to them again or just cut them out of your life. If, if they show the ability to change and they do, then good. But if they habitually do the same thing over and over and over and they're doing terrible stuff then that's different so just saying uh that shot okay this is a shot i was talking about that i was totally in love with that would look so good uh in the hallway and then there's the doors the two doors at the end with the two windows and the two guys go through it and then all of a sudden the one window you see the hand come up the maniac cop's hand come up with the knife and then he starts killing and they get killed in the other window that shot was awesome. It looks so good. And I can't imagine how tough that was to pull it off because you needed to line them up like perfectly and get every, get the action to happen exactly where it needed to. That was a great shot. I love that. I like the wasting time dialogue from the guy who was escorting Teresa at that one point where he was like, oh yeah, some attitude on you. Like you could tell that he was just like wasting time with the dialogue in order to get to him dying. Like, it, it was just a time waster. And I, I think it's funny because it plays that way. So I just laughed at it. Uh, you basically have to have a car chase on this because it's a cop film. I mean, it's heavily a cop film. So, like, you got to have a car chase. And they have a car chase. And it's a decent car chase. It's not the greatest. It's okay. 
Uh, and then I like how the Maniac Cop finally makes a, an audible noise at the end, where it's like, here he is barreling to his death, when, although, you know, it's not actually his death, as we find out at, at the end, but he even thinks it might be. So it's kind of cool that the whole time he's silent, and then at the end, um, you know, he's barreling towards towards his death, and he sees the end coming, and that's when he can actually, you know, yell. The ending says yes, there will be more. I'm I'm assuming that they that they were like we'll do more of these if it makes enough money. Which I mean, if it lost almost half a million, I don't know how they then were able to do more. I guess I'll find out when I do my research for the other ones, potentially. Uh, yeah. So some final thoughts on this. Uh, this film addresses the issue of assumptions people make based on a person's profession. Just because someone chose a certain job doesn't mean they're a good person. Or a bad person. Every human is an individual, and you shouldn't assume their intentions or their motivations. You must look for evidence of both of those things. We, as a society, have a problem with making assumptions. That is the biggest issue with a person, is the assumptions they make. Do not make assumptions. Look for the evidence. Dig into it. Talk to people. Figure things out. It, critical thinking, it's a very important thing. I'm going to bring that up again in a minute here. Uh, it also brings up human hysteria that ensues whenever they hear an unsettling news report. Because that happens too. People are very panicky and suspicious of others. I'm not sure they always have been, but the way society's gone, it is that way now. So just like in this film, that woman heard that there was a, a killer out there who was potentially a cop. So to her, every single cop she looked at was suspicious and she, so much so that she's like, I'm going to kill them before they kill me. Even though the probability of the cop, she, uh, whatever cop she would run into next would be the maniac cop, even if it was a cop, because they didn't even know at that point for sure, um, that probability was so low. But she panicked. Fear. It's par fear and paranoia, like I said, very, very strong. Personal stress also shows up a lot in this and also stress in relationships due to what profession a person has. That's a lot of kind of what's going on in the beginning with um, Jack and his wife. You know, they're kind of talking about the stressors in their relationship because of his profession. But then you also kind of figure out that he's putting in extra time with an affair. So a little bit different, I guess. And my last thought on this is this film just reminds me that you have to apply reasoning and critical thinking to every situation. And too many people think in terms of all or nothing or black or white, but life is basically all gray area that we need to know. I think society needs reminded of that, that mostly things are gray area. Just saying. Um, so take that, do with it what you will, hopefully something. Uh, but overall, I enjoyed this film. Was it an amazing film? No. Was it fun? Yeah. So out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it a very solid three star rating. I'm down with it. I'm excited to get to Maniac Cop 2 and 3 because I'm interested to see where they take it, especially knowing that Lustig and Cohen were still involved with this film. That makes me even more excited. So yeah, um, thanks for checking this out. I really appreciate it. Put some comments down there. We can talk about Maniac Cop or whatever ho other horror stuff you really want to. Uh, do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button because that is your way to show appreciation for what I'm doing since, you know, you're not paying for me doing these and, you know, I'm not making any money. So <laughs> if you could just do me a favor, hook me up, hit that subscribe, that'd be awesome. Uh, also, if you are going to hit the subscribe or you already have, hit the notification bell. That way you know whenever I'm putting up new videos or doing live streams. But regardless, thanks for checking this one out. And until next time, keep it brutal.